All right. Uh, I guess we better get this party started. Um, like uh, the island tradition way, uh, late. It's not late, it's not early, but it's right on time. Huh? Okay, uh, good morning and talo falava. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little brief background on what this session is about. Um, I guess everybody knows that uh, IGF, Global IGF uh, uh, Forum was gonna be in Kyoto this year. And there's also uh, the theme of, the overarching theme of the internet we want, empowering all people. So I guess this is where this session was born from. And uh, we've got our own um, theme for this session, which is uh, uh, the contribution from the proletarians to the internet. Uh, what we want. Uh, so this is an uh, Asian Pacific perspective um, going into it. So I guess it's, uh, it's a, dis a discussion between um, our leaders and also our young youth up and coming superstars like the ladies in the front here uh, and also Raksha. So I'm just going to do this a little bit different. Uh, I know I'm supposed to introduce everybody that's going to be speaking, but I uh, uh, from the past two days, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of the people that are doing discussions are the youth. So I want to put more time to the discussion instead of the introductions. So um, I hope you don't mind um, your honorables that are on the, on the call. Um, so I've got two questions that uh, if you can answer. So please introduce yourself, uh, your organization. And uh, the second question is, what you hope personally or from your work will get out of this uh, open discussion by the end of this open discussion. So I'll, I'll just start off. Uh, Talofa, I'm Joe Benz Manor from Samoa, uh, the Pacific part of this uh, event. And uh, I work in the private sector uh, with cybersecurity. And uh, what I hope to get out of the end of this session is uh, to do a good job in moderating this session and hopefully nobody falls asleep. Uh, so if you don't mind, Honorable uh, Sumana Shurista, if you can please, uh, those two questions. And please, we only have five minutes for introduction, so uh, make it brief, thank you. Good morning, everyone from Nepal. I'll be super brief. Um, my name is Sumana Shurista. I'm a parliamentarian from Nepal. It's my first term and um, less than a year in formal politics. I used to be firmly in private sector um, and I felt I had to do something regarding a lot of issues, especially around climate change um, and governance, which is why I joined formal politics. What I'm really hoping uh, to learn today and to hear um, are some of the concerns. I know some of the concerns um, of the youth in Nepal, but I think uh, cybersecurity and internet governance is something that will transcend boundaries um, and therefore it's important as a lawmaker to understand what are the concerns globally. Thank you. Thank you, Sumana. Uh, is um, your Honorable Mohammed Farhan, are you on the call, please? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mohammed Farhan. I am the Parliament member of Indonesia this is my first term, and I'm also uh, opposing the uh, legislation on uh, personal data protection and uh, 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 information uh, electronic of information and transaction uh, law. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Honorable. Uh, please, Anya Singh. Can please. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those who are joining us from Australia and from the rest of the world. I'm Ananya. I'm the Youth Advisor to the USAI Judicial Youth Council. I'm joining you right now from India. And I'm really looking forward to the synergy of conversations that happen in this intergenerational dialogue on what we could do better as parliamentarians or as young leaders. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you. And um, uh, lastly, uh, I have uh, my sister up here, also from Fiji. Um, they wanted to make this panel discussion colorful, so uh, they asked us to come up here. So if you don't mind, 
Um, Good morning, Bulavinaka. I'm Rukshar Khan. I'm an analyst programmer at the Pacific Community, SPC. I'm here to be the youth of the Pacific and raise my voice here at this platform to hear from the other fellows and see what are some of the things which is missing in the Pacific and how we can empower and work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. So, uh, see, that's only two minutes. Okay, um, I guess we better go straight into it. Um, I know that uh, we've been given 10 minutes per speaker. Uh, I, I like to go in that order as well. Um, so please, Your Honorable Sumana, can you share how um, Nepal is doing in including youth perspective in your policy making or your decision making uh, in this uh, digital sphere? Sure. Uh, the couple of things we're doing um, first starts with it starts with representation in the parliament itself. Um, we usually ask for a seat on the table, but as a woman, I know it's sometimes it's included as a tokenism. So a very important aspect for me and my party um, is to make sure there is a very clear stake uh, with the position. So we've got very young parliamentarians, the youngest parliamentarian. Um, it takes 25. It Someone has to be 25 years old to be a member of House of Representatives. Um, and I'm very proud to say we've got that person um, participating in House of Representatives through um, my party. Uh, so we, we've got around 11% participation from people who are in Nepal, we consider the age of 15 to 40 as youth. So we've got around 11, 11.5% representation in um, House of Representatives. That's the first aspect. The second is um, there's something we're really starting, um, something we've uh, squarely picked from the tech space of hackathons. Um, and I've started this concept of bill hackathon. Whenever there's a new bill proposed, um, I solicit information from the people um, and that enables a lot of young people who are traditionally disengaged uh, with a lot of policy making language, legal language, to connect and give their opinions. So that's uh, the second way where youth have directly engaged. Um, and finally, third is to really go out and meet the young people in their colleges to hear about their concerns uh, and participate in the activities that they are organizing um, to really give them a platform and a really strong voice to their opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honorable. Um, that's some great points that you raised. Um, I've just just got a quick question there. Um, what what are some of the areas that your youths are looking towards uh, raising um, uh, in terms of uh, bringing it up to the policy making level? Uh, there are clearly three areas that youth are really um, engaged in. First are um, First is uh, job opportunity um, and prospects of that in Nepal. We have a lot of outward migration in low skilled to really skilled workforce. Um, so they're really interested to see what I am doing as a lawmaker and what the government is doing as executive body um, to work on law, uh, job creation. The second area that youth are uh, very involved and they're, they're very interested is to understand um, what kind of policies we are tackling or we are taking on climate change. And um, the third is they are in the digital space particularly, they're really concerned about fake news and the lack of content moderation through the uh, platforms in Nepal. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'd like to pass it uh, over to the Honorable Mohammed uh, Farhan. Uh, I guess this would be the same question. Um, what is uh, your country of Indonesia, uh, especially from your position, uh, doing uh, in uh, promoting health, uh, health, sorry, youth um, in, the, in this area of digital sphere? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, in Indonesia, uh, we've been enjoying an explosion 
of the youth uh, population in the last two decades. Uh, before 2014, the participation of the youth upon the political scene is very low. But since 2012, evolving into 2014, the participation of the youth to the political scene is getting higher and higher. And now, coming into 2024 uh, election, we are now facing a growing millennials and millennials voters. That is now majority of our uh, voters in 2024. That means no one, no candidates will ignore the youth because we are 53 years old. I know I'm a dinosaur. So it's very hard for us to engage with the youth. That is why we are opening up our heart, our mind, and our will to listen to the youth. One of the biggest concerns of the youth is not to be, uh, not to be related to the issue that is been uh, going on in the parliament and in the government. Uh, that concerns create a lot of uh, eagerness from the youth to be involved in the politics in whatever uh, role that they can make. Most of the channel that really you seem to engage with uh, the youth is throughout the social media especially uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and also, uh, this is very funny, the WhatsApp group and TikTok, of course. So uh, right now, there are a lot of politicians learning the 101 of using their social media and engaging the youth to really understand the youth. And the best thing about it, uh, two out of three presidential Candidate in 2024 in Indonesia. They both are yeah. baby. So I think uh, we feel that we are on the right track. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Your Honorable. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Your Honorable. Uh, the connection is a little bit uh, iffy. Um, the sound's not coming right, uh, but uh, we, we can still hear you. Uh, so uh, from from that uh, we've heard from two of uh, our parliamentary yeah, uh, in this call. Uh, so uh, I think it's time to hear from uh, our youth. Uh, please, Miss Anya Singh, uh, your experiences uh, working closely with youth and member of parliaments, and what are you doing in the area of uh, harnessing this uh, digital age? Uh, thank you very much. And this is Anania for the record. And uh, to answer your question, well, people aged 15 to 24 account for 1.2 billion or roughly 16% of the world's population. As digital natives, we, the youth, have grown up in a world where technology is an integral part of our daily lives. Our fluency in navigating digital platforms and our ability to adapt to new technology makes us valuable contributors to the development of digital solutions. Young people like me, and well, like many of you here today, often bring fresh ideas and creative approaches to problem solving which can drive innovation and push boundaries in the digital realm. Our enthusiasm, energy, and willingness to embrace change makes us crucial agents for shaping the future of our hybrid world. But the internet, while serving as an effective medium of empowerment, also has at times acted as an echo chamber for bad actors to conduct nefarious activities and propel instances of abuse on vulnerable users, especially the youth. These activities tend to have disastrous impacts uh, and effects on uh, social behavior, mental health, and in many ways undermine the many positives of the digital arena. Let me illustrate this by giving you a very personal example. Uh, I would also like to issue a trigger warning before I begin. Um, in April 2020, amid the devastating pandemic, the internet was shaken by a notorious video. 
that glorified a man spitting acid on a woman's face who had previously rejected his romantic advances. Recognizing the harmful impact of such a content, I took action by initiating an online petition asking TikTok to regularly moderate content on its app. My petition received 158,000 plus signatures in a week's time. This incident highlights the alarming trend of the virtual normalization of real life gender-based violence through digital means, including, but not limited to, memes, dope, tweets, and reels. As we already know, human rights and human dignity continue to be threatened by hate speech, cyberbullying, online sexual abuse, and privacy infringements. Just yesterday, I was speaking at one of the APRIG sessions on how, even before children are born, their data finds its way to the world. While massive amounts of data are being collected about almost everyone, even as I speak, children and youth who may be less aware of their risks and their rights in relation to the processing of their personal data and their online privacy, who may not be able to provide meaningful consent uh, for the collection and usage of their personal data, and who may speak a language other than English, continue to remain more vulnerable. While we all would agree that children and youth must be afforded the agency and ability to define who they are for themselves, their future pathways are being unduly and very unfortunately narrowed down and predetermined by algorithms. I also believe you all will agree with me when I say technology is not neutral and an algorithm is just an opinion in code. Young people continue to struggle to strike a balance between their right to freedom of speech and expression online and the constant threats of online trolls, disinformation and deepfakes. Most young people would also express concerns about the impact of excessive screen time and negative comments on their mental health. I'm in fact organizing multiple sessions at IGF 2023, one of which is focused on how, despite our hopes for the internet to be a discrimination-free, inclusive space, power structures continue to be firmly rooted even within the technical infrastructure. For example, Videos and comments in languages other than English take longer to be taken down, irrespective of how dangerous and abusive the content is. UNESCO's 2019 publication called I Would Blush If I Could revealed how digital voice assistants such as Alex and Siri reflect, reinforce, and spread gender bias by modeling acceptance and tolerance of sexual harassment and verbal abuse, sending explicit and implicit messages about how women and girls should respond to requests and express themselves. By making women the face of glitches and errors that result from the limitations of hardware and software designed predominantly by men. Hence, technology-enabled isms and phobias have become rampant online. But the trauma that many marginalized groups face online is often disregarded. Young people from the global south and from marginalized groups and communities have the right to feel and be safe online. Long story short, as a generation of young people born into the digital age, we understand how digital technologies impact and impair our aspirations and rights. All we need is a platform to be actually heard. This is where the beauty of digital technology comes in handy. Given that digital technology helps to enhance our capacity to engage with and empower the youth, there is no excuse anymore to not reach out and actually seek input from the youth in a participation way, treating them as the active and equal partners of digital development as they are. Recognizing this, the USAID, because for long prioritized positive youth development, established the Digital Youth Council in 2021. I consider it to be my absolute privilege to have been a part of the USAID Digital Youth Council since its very first day. Over the past two years, the Council has not only served as an important voice in helping to guide the implementation of USAID's digital strategy, but has also helped to raise awareness about digital harms in many countries and influence national leaders, the private sector, civil society, local communities and other youth on how best to keep safe while learning, playing and exploring in digital world. Having been given the opportunity to feel 
safe while speaking my mind, the room to confidently express my concerns, and the scope to actively inspire the policies of an international agency, I feel my role as the youth advisor to the USAID Digital Youth Council is the perfect example of nothing for us without us. As we can see in my own example, the, the first step towards creating something for the youth is by involving them in the decision-making process, which can be achieved through youth councils like that of the USAID Digital Youth Council, youth consultations, youth forums, and partnerships with youth-led organizations. Policymakers should not only create platforms, but should also ensure that these platforms are safe spaces that enable young people to voice their concerns share their experiences and contribute their ideas to digital policy. Members of parliament can also support the youth in the digital age by advocating for legislation that protects young people from both conventional and non-conventional forms of online harms. With uh, popular platforms now being accessed by children, the youth and adults, simultaneously, it is uncertain who is being influenced by what content and who may be encouraged to replicate a problematic or harmful action in the real world. But as we know, the younger people are, the more impressionable they are. While technology companies will always have a substantial role to play in designing responsible technology, members of parliament can hold technology companies accountable for their action by conducting inquiries, hearings, and investigations into issues related to responsible technology. They can also work towards establishing regulatory bodies and have mechanisms that monitor and enforce compliance with responsible technology standards. Members of parliament can also organize competitions focused on responsible technology, inviting young people to showcase their innovative ideas and solutions. This will not only encourage creativity, but will also provide a platform to young people to actively contribute to the design and development of responsible technology. Members of parliament can also work towards bridging the digital divide by advocating for policies that ensure affordable and accessible internet access for all young people. Additionally, they can also drive initiatives that promote digital literacy and education, empowering young people with the skills and knowledge required to navigate the digital world safely and responsibly. By engaging in a dialogue with young people, by collaborating with them, and by championing their concerns, members of parliament can effectively shape policies that create a positive, inclusive, and secure digital space for the youngest members of the society. Uh, I guess that that's my response to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anya. That's a very comprehensive uh, response. <laughs> and we're right on time. Uh, I guess the next section of this is... Uh, we pass it back to the floor. Uh, I guess we'll start the discussion with Raksha here. Um, you're, you're representing you for Fiji. Uh, what are the current challenges uh, you, you're facing uh, in the Pacific or in, also in Fiji? Uh, we have youth champions in the Pacific that continue to do an amazing work on the ground. Uh, they are the trailblazers in the area of ICT, digital technologies, AEI, and other emerging technologies. But we still have a very underrepresentation of our youth, especially in policy making, parliamentary representation, uh, in decision making for what the youths, where their sustainability and engagement should be. I believe this is cause of our remoteness, our location lack of sustainability, funding, and lack of initiation that is out there. Uh, while our youths are navigating a digital landscape that is both full of promise and challenges, we still face issues with digital divide and access inequality. This is our countries are still in remote areas have issues with connectivity, reliable internet connections. So this puts our youth at the very edge where they are not able to come up ensuring equal access to digital resources, which is a significant concern. Uh, with the rise of social media, now we have a lot of individuals from the Pacific that are on these social media platforms. It raises concerns on cyberbullying, online safety issues. And we only have some countries which have legislation which protects our youth our genders in these dimensions. Uh, most of our countries are still lacking policies on cyberbullying on online safety commissions. Um, 
uh, there is inequality in uh, quality digital education as quality and availability of digital resources are still inconsistent across our Pacific countries. Uh, lack of access to resources, funding and mentorship for our youths to come up with digital entrepreneurship. Um, we Another thing that is lacking in our society is that the youth do not have a voice. Uh, they seek a voice in decision-making process that can shape digital policies. Our youth struggle to have a voice at the national high levels events. Uh, we are underrepresented at all the forums. Um, even we see here is only few of the Pacific Islanders that are here to represent us. And we feel that Pacific Islanders need to be given more opportunities to go to this ground and represent themselves because we need to hear from our youths. Hearing from the youths, then only we will know and understand what are the challenges they are facing down in the countries. Thank you. Thank you, Reksha. Um, so I guess it's open to the floor. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention I have also a uh, co-moderator that's online, uh, Celine. Uh, do you have anything from our online participation? Thank you very much for introducing me. Um, no, actually nothing from, from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so now open to the floor. Um, I guess I, uh, there's a few questions here so that we can open uh, our discussion. Uh, what are the main concerns of the young generation in the digital space? Uh, what should parliamentaries know about youth priorities? in the internet government space? How should policymakers uh, harness uh, youth perspectives? So uh, please open to the floor. Okay, hello. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jenna Fong, head of Asia Pacific Youth Internet Governance Forum. Um, in the past couple of days, we had happened to have a hybrid event at the Asia Pacific Internet Governance Forum uh, right before this um, workshop. So we really get to discuss many different issues that the young people care about because that YIGF is initiated, organized fully, completely uh, by youth. And so we get to discuss different issues. And uh, of course, there are a million things that we care about. A um, few takeaways um, from, from the discussion there. I think we mainly focus on, you, you know, it's, it's very urgent for us to actually work on empowerment in terms of like digital literacy. Uh, as well as a concern on how the future of work in the age of emerging technology, especially uh, with the rapid advancement of artificial intelligence. Of course, so you have lots of discussion and we'll make sure everything is documented and then circulate to uh, all stakeholders at different level because uh, from all the dis conversations within the youth community regionally or globally, we believe that it's very important of stakeholder of all generations from different discipline or background to actually provide support to empower the next generation, regardless of their age, with uh, knowledge about the technical level of the internet, practical level of the internet, as well as the policy level of the internet. Because it's very easy for, relatively easy, for the young people to relate to application level of the internet because we live on the internet. We are in the age where we have an entire economy built on top of the internet. So it's relatively easy for them to relate. But in order for them to care about privacy or cybersecurity, by that I mean everyone, um, not only the young people, to understand it, they have to 
know about the technical level, but more often than not, not everyone's from the technical background. Me myself is, you know, graduated from business school. I have no knowledge about how things work, but it affects my life every day. And so, as someone who are in the space who, who work for capacity building for quite some time, I think it's very important for everyone to work together to make sure we have that、um, means to. Um, to empower everyone regarding、uh, the governance of the internet and governance on the internet um, through um, at, at all level, and uh, to uh, just quickly respond to what what this lady mentioned earlier. Sorry, but I, I I'm not really good at remembering name, but I think in order to include the youth voice heard, we must systemically include. The young generations in all the discussion, we're not just.、Oh, this is a very good stat that we have this workshop together. We sit together to make a conversation, and I'm really glad that you know the format we have here is to have the panel to share their thoughts, their experience, and we have an open floor. That means we open to everyone to talk at an equal footing, but not like we ask question to the speaker only, but everyone, because. I personally think that sometimes we should ask a question to the floor, get our thoughts out, so people who are in the position where they can make decision can know what exactly. Because yesterday, we at the youth IGF we had the chance to meet up with the、uh, lot of industry expert. Of course, we will always be bound.、Uh, it's it's very easy. It's just human nature that we will be.、Um, Will be limited by our experience and knowledge, and then we thought, oh, AI will only affect low skilled labor because of many different reasons and factors, right? But in fact, maybe you know, just a few months back, when the hype of AI hit the world, and then many people got carried away with it. What we we see is that it's not really just low skilled labor, but people, for example, freelance writer like myself. Um, you know, got impact directly right away. People who work for customer service got affected. So it is the result is not what we imagine. And in order to know that, we need to have conversation with people and then keep that going. But in the longer term, I think、um, to empower the next generation, we must get the capacity building、uh, in a more formal way. Get that into education system and all, and as young people in the room and your friends out there, I think we really should work hard on getting us ready to understand all the, all, all the technical background in order to make solid to bring solid substance to the table. I'm、um, so sorry that I am making a very long speech, and I will stop here. But thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much.、Uh, I I I, I forgot to mention.、Um, we want to everybody to have a discussion. So、we'll, if we can please、uh, limit our time to a minute and a half. And I also like to before I pass it back to another youth person that's in here.、Um, we have some people from government here as well.、Uh, Do you guys want to share anything、uh, from from the policymaker side of things? I like to pass it back and forth, so I think that's better than、uh, from a one sided.、Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Ian Sheldon. I'm the、uh, director of internet governance from the Australian Government Department of Infrastructure.、Um, I, I think it's fantastic to see you all here today. I think this is a perfect example of of trying to build that dialogue and interface out between decision makers and 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 the youth of today.、Um, you know, I, I guess I guess I'm quite quite interested in、uh, in picking up some of the, the comments that you made, Jenna, about the need to、um, to to build out that technical understanding of of the, the processes and the systems that we use.、Um, And to look at both aspects of, of governance of the internet as, as well as governance on the internet,、um, and so I'm I'm particularly interested in ways we can explore building more of that technical understanding. I mean, I think we can we can definitely start by by looking at、um, early stage learning and, and and the education system. But but I'm also curious about how much、um, genuine interest there is in in internet governance issues more more directly. 
and, uh, and, and finding ways to build a holistic picture of, of the system. I think there's, um, there was a really interesting dialogue uh, a couple of days ago in the, in the town hall. We're talking about trust and trust in systems. Um, and for me, it was, it was quite stark, the, the generational difference about the, the approaches that we have to technology and the implicit trust that we bring to those dialogues. Um, and I'd, I'd be very, very interested to hear from, from all of those here today about what we can do to, to marry the, the, the trust in the technology with the technical understanding. Um, you know, is, can, can government do a better job of unpacking some of that layer of the internet and, um, and I guess helping, helping to build more of a, um, a, a deeper understanding so you maybe a little less inherently trusting of a lot of the processes and the challenges that we, that we face in, in navigating the digital age. Um, and so for me, as a, as a policymaker, that, that's, a, that's one of my core interests here today and, and primarily what I'm quite keen on, on hearing um, some responses on. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so we'll pass it back to the youth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Um, uh, one quick response, like a very partial response, and a few comments about the session and a few questions to the parliamentarians. Uh, with respect to the question that you asked about building technical understanding from the basics, one of the approaches that I think APNIC has sort of started is the IP Go game. And that I think is a very strong way or a very strong segue into how they can connect and reconnect with the youth community and especially those who are not from technical backgrounds but still are interested and it's very relevant for them to learn about this. So I think that is one factor that's just a starting step and they're also looking to evolve it and build on it further, add stages to it, make it a little more complex so we understand the deeper intricacies, but that's a very good start. So I think something along those lines would be very educational and very helpful for every one of us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, a few comments to, a few questions to our parliamentarians and um, everyone present here today. One aspect, so for the record, I'm Shraddha Pandey. I'm stand, representing uh, the APRIGF fellows here. And I'm a member of the youth standing group of the Internet Society board member, current board member. So um, one thing that we're observing is that governments across the world these days are requesting for a public comment on any new laws or any new privacy policies that they seek to develop. And youth communities do take a lot of time, effort and energy into submitting their comments and their opinions on these laws. But the, there is a slight disconnect when the ultimate version or uh, that comes out between what we suggested and what the ultimate version is. However, we don't have a problem that it was completely different or they evolved the jurisprudence or the legal analysis in a different way. The issue is sometimes it appears as if the recommendations weren't even considered. And that makes us feel like it's only a token representation that is given for a facial value rather than actual meaningful engagement with the youth community. Uh, so a uh, discussion about what the youth community can do to gain more credibility that the opinions and the ideas that we bring to the table are not invaluable enough to be dismissed at, to be prima facie dismissed, right? You can at least consider them, see that there is, a, either there is merit in it, you can keep them or you can disregard them later. But we don't merit a prima facie interaction with those uh, suggestions. And that is something I want to know how we can change and evolve that. Um, so yeah, so one more thing that I wanted to add a little bit is that uh, the way digital natives understand and analyze our relationship with technology is starkly different from the way our previous generations or the generations which learned about technology as they grew up. Uh, did. So maybe taking into consideration how what our priorities are on the internet and what 
is important for us. So one example I can quote of this is the Generation Connect group of the International Telecommunications Union. The very first thing they did when they selected the youth envoys was send out a survey, list out the top priorities that the world's across uh, the countries across the world consider as the most important in terms of uh, hierarchical priorities in terms of dealing with cyber issues and internet governance issues. And they asked us to rank them. And surprisingly, the results were very different for the Asia Pacific region and the European region and the Latin Americas. But what was also different was uh, the priorities that were set and decided by the world in general were different from the prior The order of priorities was different for us. So while cybersecurity ranged in the topmost, digital equality, equity and inclusion was not one of the highest priorities, but it was for us. And cybersecurity was right next to it. So we saw them as equal priorities or at least equivalent priorities rather than one below the other or something that comes later, like the concept of privacy by design, safety by design and inclusivity by design is something that we are trying to put forward and we're trying to include. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the response. I'd like to pass it back to our online um, uh, speakers. Uh, your, uh, Samana, if you don't mind, um, what are some of the ways that you are looking to change all of these challenges that uh, our youth have just raised? Uh, or what are your, currently, your, your country is doing currently in combating this, please? Uh, let me actually take the last question. I think that's very pertinent because um, I think there are practical ways to go about it. Um, just like in any democracy, right, when a bill is proposed, when a law is proposed, when a policy is proposed, it's basically a decision by the majority of representatives, whether it passes or doesn't pass. Um, I'm right now in opposition. So there are a lot of laws, there are a lot of amendments that I propose that don't go through at all, that gets dismissed. One of the things um, that is really important is to be persistent. Uh, that's how I have seen my vote. Um, that's the first uh, point. Uh, the second is, I know it's very frustrating as youth, you're putting a lot of effort um, to be heard. This is why I said what I said earlier is it's not, it's not enough um, to get a seat on the table. It's very important to have a very clear platform. Um, and that is actually the title. I think I would really encourage the youth to actually start getting the titles that will get you uh, to be decision maker yourself, not just voices to be heard, right? This is one of the important areas where more youth they are, there are uh, as parliamentarians, as lawmakers, uh, the uh, ideas that you have get a fast track. Um, look, that was one of the main reason why I decided to be a parliamentarian, even though I have not been in political space at all. Uh, primarily because I was like, I'm putting voices uh, and those are not getting a proper um, discussion, whether they get rejected or they, they get dismissed. Why? Right. I think that's one of the key ways. So I'd like to really encourage a lot of young people to really consider uh, policymaking as rather than waiting until a certain age to really get involved in this profession of policymaking uh, to be a representative of um, our generation, of your generation, right? That's the second point. And the third is really to hold your uh, parliamentarian or your representatives accountable uh, to when they solicit ideas to get a clear reason why something was taken forward or why something wasn't taken forward and to ask transparency. I think one of the things, one of the key things uh, when it comes to governance, uh, on on top of internet platform is the quickness uh, and the speed at which we can respond. I became uh, I I was able to uh, be a parliamentarian primarily because we connected with our voter base through social media. Uh, that's how we were able to connect to a lot of youth, urban youth who have access um, to internet and to Facebook or uh, through TikTok or through YouTube. Right. Um, so I think it's very important to demand of your parliamentarians, of your policymakers, as they exist now, to have an accountability and to basically drop quick lines on when you propose certain ideas, why they are taken or not taken. Uh, what I can definitely tell as policymaker is once you make 
um, a certain policy, there are a lot of cross-cutting issues. That particular policy touches a lot of other policies. Um, so it takes time uh, to consider a particular um, idea. That's something I have seen uh, myself. And the second area is as soon as you make uh, a certain policy. In Nepal, we have a huge divide, right? A uh, digital divide. There is also a big question of if we were to do certain thing, would that then put a huge population of um, rural youth out of touch? For example, I am a big advocate for uh, doing a lot of things digitally, but that th what that would mean is taking resources away from physical human face-to-face -face interaction with the uh, service seeker, the public, and then putting that into developing a secure app, right? So there has to be a balance that we tread on to make sure the rural population, not just rural youth, rural population still have access to services. And that is a fine line that we tread. Um, so here are some of the um, reasons, uh, but first and foremost, I think it's very important to actually get into the policy making. Um, yourself. And the larger the youth population in policymaking, there's a lot of issues um, that ails youth more than, uh, I mean, especially issues around climate change that requires very hard decisions, that requires us to put aside our uh, historic national differences. And that is something that I really feel youth would be able to do more than um, the, the traditional crop of politicians. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honorable. Um, I think I have a question on the floor. Uh, it's not a question. I was about to share my opinion earlier, but uh, thank you for uh, the IGF Secretariat for organizing this, uh, giving a quick introduction. My name is Ananda Gautam. I'm from Nepal, and I represent Youth IGF Nepal, as well as the UN Youth Track Organizing Committee. So my point is we are very thankful that this session actually happened at this moment. And the thing is, uh, we are pretty good in backside in Nepal. We are honored to have our parliamentarian right beside. So I think it's changing in part of Nepal. But uh, what I see is we have uh, this kind of forum all over the world. Uh, national IGF, youth IGFs are in every country. and. The point to be noted is that how our parliamentarians engage with those local initiatives so that the issues are, you know, if we take the consideration into APAC region, it is very diverse and the issues are very diverse. The issues of Pacific Island is very diverse. The issue of landlocked countries like Nepal is diverse, India is diverse. And to actually get a uh, the real issues of youth into the policy making, they have to engage with their local initiatives who are facing or facilitating those issues. And uh, this kind of uh, interaction actually helps it a lot to know that what kind of initiatives are there on the ground working for uh, the issues on internet governance, fighting for it. And uh, a good advocacy is being happened back in Nepal. Uh, a lot of young politicians got elected this time. This was uh, a bit of silver lining out of like black shadows. And I think if uh, those young politicians and parliamentarians uh, actually advocate for the issues of youth and other digital issues that we are facing in the world, while, you know, APAC is one of the reasons where still 40% of the population is not connected to the internet. Being said that there are many challenges. It's not as easy to get the another 60%, uh, the rest of the 40% is the difficult portion, which will take more time, more effort, more investment to get connected. But being said that, we have to make efforts to make that and other issues like freedom of expression that are being curtailed all over the APAC region, mostly in South Asia and Southeast Asia, is it's like uh, we have been seeing the, I think, a lot of curtails and those kind of issues too, get parliamentarians into this kind of session and we are having i think uh, in october in kyoto there's also a parliamentary track i hope to see many parliamentarians there so that we can discuss these issues 
get back to our country and like involve with the local ecosystem so that we can make the policies that actually affect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've just been warned that I have uh, about 10 minutes left. Um, so I guess we're on a wrap up uh, session now. I'll pass it back online if uh, you don't Can mind. I say something? Yes, please go ahead, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to uh, respond and add to uh, Ms. Samana uh, mentioned about the participation of the youth. Uh, yes, it is nice to have more youth into the political uh, scene to involve in the policy making, but I know it's very hard. Uh, uh, the fact is, there is one very interesting detail in our law in Indonesia. There is a law in Indonesia in how to write a law. In that law of how to write a law, digital form of input is not considered to be a legal input to be considered in policy making process. So in that terms, I think what the youth need to do right now is to create a very strong digital youth pressure group that will affluent that become the affluent group that will influence a lot of policy making process. Uh, I have seen some a couple of youth that created some digital platform in order to be related to the political scene in Indonesia since 2012. But then, as they grow up into an adult like me, they're gone. There's no sustainability in it. The recruitment among the youth itself is not sustainable. So I think that's a challenge and also a little bit of a critical point of view about how to harness the youth spirit in involving into the policy making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Honorable. Uh, so I would give the the last say to um uh, not the last say, but one more one more comment from Youth IGF because this is a youth uh, session. Uh, Jenna, again, I will be really quick, and actually, I would like to speak at personal capacity on this round because uh, we have. I'm just an internet user like everyone else. And uh, since we have this opportunity to have public sectors as well as MPs in, in here, I, I just want to raise what well, myself as an internet user really like to see is that to, um, you know, having government to take more initiative to work with private sectors in all stakeholder, uh, particularly to formally include maybe academias into legislation making process to consult uh, um, their research and everything so we can we know and put public interests in priority and also to take the initiative to work with private sectors because like I said earlier we mentioned about social media as well this privately owned public space is influencing our life um, and um, every day and so uh, they are like running a private government sometimes. They have so much power. I personally, from Hong Kong, a more privileged uh, economy, and I'm based in Canada. Um, and uh, recently, I can see that, you know, there's an online uh, online news act happening there where um, some companies uh, will, will, you know, in response to the government's suggestions on, you know, new regulations, of course, they may not be the happiest situation. And so they, they decided to block the news and we don't get to access to any international news. Uh, if you want to see news, you can go to do radio, you know, go to radio or watch TV. But is that how the new generation get the information right? It's jeopardizing our rights. I, I know something similar probably also happened in Australia a few years back, but then the government found a way, but then that might not be the case for many other countries. And so I really urge policymakers in where you ha are in the position, please work with all the stakeholders, try to develop and find a balance where making sure everyone in their role would care about the public interest and put it at the top priority. That's the one thing I would really want to make. And lastly, 
myself, I'm from certain place of this world, and then I can't speak for everyone. So we need representation and we need more people so we can get everyone's concern heard. And, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to pass it back online. Please, uh, uh, Samana, uh, Mohammed, uh, Anya, if you can please uh, wrap us up uh, just a minute each. Um, thank you. Uh, can I start? Please. Okay, thank you, Sumana. Well, I think uh, what we need to do right now is to create a, a common digital platform that will ensuring the sustainability of the youth involvement in policy making. It is natural that the youth are not eager to join the political party like myself and Ms. Sumana Shrestha. But we need the voice of the youth and we need them not only to be heard, you are right, but also to be seriously considered as an affluent group that will give influence and pressure to us, the politicians. Thank you. Samana, um, I'll go. Thank you. Uh, here are some of the final thoughts. I think we talked about a lot of um, issues ranging uh, quite a span. Um, here are a couple of issues I would really consider all of us to consider. Um, there will be technology that will be developing to tackle deep fakes um, or to tackle um, fake news, right? Those are some of the technologies that we should be willing to share amongst all the countries because that impacts everyone. I hope in those areas, uh, we're very generous with sharing knowledge uh, with the countries who are yet to catch up on a lot of this technological front. Um, and second, uh, I would really like to second our uh, parliamentarian from Indonesia, Mohammed, that it's, it's very important um, that you hold your parliamentarians and your politicians very, very accountable. Um, don't stop asking difficult questions. Um, and also I would really ask you to consider actually being in the space. Um, I know it's difficult to be a public figure because uh, then every aspect of your life is scrutinized as I'm discovering. But I think that's one of the jump uh, young population needs to make. Um, there are a lot of issues. There are so many critical issues that we face um, as as human race, right? Especially uh, climate change. Again, I keep on bringing climate change because this is one area where uh, action of one particular country is not enough to tackle it. Also on the digital space where there are deep fakes or dark web, we as the entire human race needs to come together to come up with, all right, these are the common basic things that we will do to support each other. Um, and these are the things I feel like youth, which makes up a huge chunk, uh, especially in the developing nations. If you step in the political space, then serious changes will be possible. Um, and it's not just going to be about being heard, but also being right there to implement your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honorable. I'll just pass it over to Anya. Your Thank you very thoughts. much. Um, uh, I think I, I just want to add that I personally do not encourage the idea that uh, you have to be a politician all the time to be heard because that defeats the idea of being a normal citizen. You can still make an impact while being a normal citizen. And I would always encourage that. And hence, uh, that gives the space to you to actually be uh, more into advocacy and uh, activism. So like you have seen in my case, I started an online petition. I work for a youth uh, council. So you can always do that. There are, uh, there are situations when we are not heard. I, I don't deny that, but then there will be situations when we will be heard if we are persistent enough. That could be about climate change, that could be about internet governance, but if you keep demanding something, if you show 
passion if you gather a lot of people to agree with you to also show that there are so many people who share this concern the government will have to listen because at the end of the day they will have to come to you for asking for votes so don't worry they will listen to you uh, so all the very best and thank you very much thank you anya so finally okay um last uh, creating platforms and facilitating open dialogue between young people and decision making. I think that's the main thing. Communication is the key. So we need both the parties to hear each other out to come to a conclusion. Advocating for digital inclusion policies that bridge uh, the digital drive, uh, leaving no one behind. Uh, and lastly, collaborating effort between government, private sectors and civil so society that can come and facilitate a sustainable solution. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're right on time. Five minutes past. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll just wrap up um, some final thoughts uh, from from our lawmakers and our policymakers. Uh, please, uh, they want us to pursue the career in being a politician. <laughs> Fast track yourself. I guess another point that I've heard there is uh, persistence. Uh, our, our lawmakers that are fighting the good fight up there. So be persistent uh, from our youths. Uh, more inclusive, uh, as, as we heard from IGF uh, Global uh, uh, Youth, um, uh, please allow our private sector to be amongst your discussions of these uh, policies and uh, regulations. And um, finally, um, I want everybody to uh, I'll give us the three cheers. Uh, so first cheer for our online uh, speakers. Hip, hip. Oh, come on. One more. Hip, hip. A cheer for my, my our, our, our panelists up here. Hip hip. I think a, a little bit louder. Hip hip. Nobody's going to lunch unless I hear louder. Hip hip. Hooray. Okay, and one for myself. Hip hip. Hooray. Hooray. Thank, you, uh, thank you very much for being part of the discussion. I hope you have a good day. Coffee thank for you. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.